Hi, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Hillary Ross, Zoom Security Product Marketing Manager, and I'll be moderating today's event. A few quick housekeeping items. Please go ahead and add all your security and privacy questions to the Q&A panel, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. For questions on how to use certain features, we highly recommend you visit our knowledge panel at support.zoom.us, watch our how-to videos on YouTube, read our blog posts, or attend a daily training. We will add the links to these resources in the webinar chat. We are recording this webinar and we'll send the link to registrants. We're once again excited to provide you an update on the progress we continue to make with respect to privacy and security, as well as the opportunity to ask Eric and a few of our top team members questions. For today's agenda, we're gonna have Eric, our founder and CEO, share some of the key highlights on our progress since our last webinar on January 27th. We'll then have Max Crone, our head of, engin uh, her head of security engineering, provide updates on our end-to-end -end encryption offering. He'll be followed by Valchami, our president of product and engineering, who will talk about Zoom's engineering security program. Then we'll hear from Ron Emerson, our global healthcare lead, who will share details about our Zoom for healthcare offering in HIPAA. And lastly, we'll open it up for Q&A with all the presenters, as well as our chief technology officer, Brendan Idelson. And with that, I'll turn it over to Eric. Uh, thank you, Hilary, and thank you all. So first of all, I want to say, you know, we are very excited welcome you all back to our webinar, which we are continuing to host every month as part of our ongoing commitment to being transparent with our users about our privacy and security efforts, as well as share some product updates. We've had a lot of positive developments in the past months that I'm very excited to share with you. With its 2020 Company of the Year Award. You know, and uh, first I want to you know, share that the Frost and Sullivan a market research firm has recognized Zoom with its year 2020 Company of the Year Award, honoring Zoom's dedication to providing customers with innovative solutions that drive growth and deliver new capabilities. Additionally, Earlier this month, we announced the general availability of Zoom Rooms innovations that will help organizations safely re-enter the office and sustain an everywhere workforce. As the safety of employees will continue to be a top priority for organizations around the world, they will likely take a gradual fixed approach to bringing employees back to the office uh, full-time. Businesses can use our technology to empower workers wherever they are, streamline collaborations between in-office and uh, remote, remote workers, and also make the transition back into the office as seamless as uh, possible. So whether it's in an office, or co-located space or remote location or at home, Zoom's platform enables organizations to put employee health and safety at the center of their strategy without sacrificing privacy and security. As you all know, we continually strive to educate our users on how they can help help keep themselves safe and secure on our platform. So recently, February 9th was Safer Internet Day, which provided a great opportunity to emphasize and share some safety best practices on Zoom platform. In observance of this year's theme, together for a better internet, we created some YouTube videos for teachers and parents about online classroom safety and how to create a safe digital learning experience for students and teachers on Zoom platform. With that, I will now hand it over to Max. Hey, Max. Hello, uh, thank you, Eric. Um, 
Thanks for that. Uh, before I dive in, let me say uh, that I'm very pleased with the progress of our end-to-end -end encryption offering and all the amazing work that, um, that my team has been doing here on, um, on, on this product. Um, and while we're still in phase one of our offering, I'm incredibly excited about what's coming next. So let me walk you through some of um, the recent end-to-end -end encryption updates, what we've rolled out and what we still have planned. First off, we're constantly updating the white paper as part of our commitments to security and transparency. So see our GitHub page for version three of the white paper, which was released in December with updates from our phase one implementation and more details around phases two and three. As part of the Zoom 5.5 client that was released in January, one-on-one -on -one private chats are live in end-to-end -end encryption mode. These chats use pairwise cryptographic keys. So Zoom and other participants are cryptographically pre prevented from reading private messages sent between two participants in end-to-end -end encryption mode. In addition, we've re-enabled meeting reactions in end-to-end -end encrypted meetings, giving participants the ability to provide real-time non-audio feedback and reactions to information being shared in meetings. We are also continuing to work on extending our end-to-end -end encryption offering to breakout rooms. We will share an update with that once it's ready, and hopefully that'll be quite soon. With that, I will now hand it over to Velchami, our president and product of engineering. Hey, uh, thanks, Max. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so I've been here since uh, June, and we made a lot of progress uh, on the engineering and security side uh, and uh, pretty proud of what the team has done together uh, along with uh, our CISOs team as well as uh, Max's team. If you look at the uh, our security vision, I think what we are trying to do is how do we build a very scalable and a mature security program? And to do that, uh, like, uh, I mean, there are different things that we needed to do. One is basically there is training that we need to do. We need to make sure that we have all the processes in place and then we need to uh, like insert all the tools and technologies that are needed. And also how do you scale and how do you automate, et cetera. So uh, we'll quickly review our SDLC, uh, the process uh, like what we are using. So every company has its own uh, security development life cycle. So if you look at ours, uh, I think we have a design phase uh, and pretty much in every one of these stages, uh, there are checks and balances. I think there is a, dedicated owner assigned from a security standpoint. And uh, everything is thought from security and privacy uh, like upfront. And then there is also metrics for all of these. And this is not a one-way process. Actually, we design, build, test stage, and we go live. But there is continuous monitoring and production as well. And then uh, whatever we find, we do find uh, based on pen test, uh, like third-party testing, or even our bug bounty program, we bring it back to the design stage to see like how did we miss this uh, like on the design stage, et cetera. It's sort of a closed loop. We continuously uh, keep improving this. And then uh, like every stage, we are at a different sta level of maturity. Uh, but I think there is a lot of progress being made in uh, like all of, all of these uh, areas. And then we'll focus on a couple of areas. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, uh, the security architecture. I, I think our belief is uh, this uh, security architecture is the most important. So you need to actually uh, build everything from the beginning. So otherwise it's basically uh, fixing things after the fact. So this is a very key area. So you're focusing a lot on this and make sure that when we design, uh, first of all, the engineers, uh, they're all going through lots and lots of training. And there are embedded teams from security working with engineering, there is security ownership and uh, make sure that it, all the designs are signed off. We even have like product managers now that are dedicated to security in addition to all our security uh, teams and there are product managers uh, dedicated to privacy as well so this is where we need to make sure that we start all the rest of it is if we do a good job here rest of it is just check checkpoints just to make sure that uh, safety net to make sure nothing gets loose and as we mature i think it'll get uh, uh, this process will be the key to uh, get us to our vision uh, next slide is uh, I, and then there is a lot of uh, testing and automation that we do. And in addition to the design, and then the, we need a lot of these automation uh, as part of our CI CD. Uh, that is because uh, like you want it to be embedded into the process. And we are also trying to make sure that we do all of this, but minimize the overhead. Okay, we, we still want to be agile. We want to deliver like everything that you want uh, like in time, but we also want to make sure that the security and privacy DNA gets built into that. 
So there is a lot of tools and automation uh, that we are putting in here. And this is not just the engineering team. Uh, this is, a, we have like a security assurance team, uh, like under JSON, and then we have like a Maxis team uh, focused on a lot of security plus the engineering team. So a lot of good work going on here. And uh, thanks everyone for attending this session. Uh, let me just uh, hand it over to our uh, head of healthcare, uh, Ron Emerson. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, um, Vilchami. So first of all, I just uh, it's great to be here with everyone in this webinar. Uh, just a little bit about my uh, background. Um, I've worked in the healthcare industry for over two decades and I've actually had an opportunity to go to 46 different countries um, to enable uh, um, telemedicine applications or video-based applications. So regardless of where you're um, viewing this video from around the world, it's a real pleasure to, to have you here today and to be able to speak with you. So um, it's been an honor to lead Zoom's healthcare offering. Um, um, of course, uh, it's even become more crucial in our healthcare customers around the world as we've had to rely on telemedicine more uh, heavily during this, um, as we'd all agree, this unprecedented pandemic that we're, that we're currently in. Um, I think what's important and what we're here to talk about is, you know, at Zoom, we're continuously expanding and enhancing our platform um, to help our healthcare customers um, so you can operate uh, and do more things and do it more efficiently with the Zoom platform in healthcare. So let's talk about the Zoom for healthcare. Um, you know, the pandemic has certainly accelerated the trend, um, but video was already becoming a necessary component in the delivery of healthcare, especially as we are developing different delivery models and different payment systems. Um, but it's not just for innovating care delivery, but it's also expanding access to care. Um, we'd all agree and know that there's a correlation between access to care and quality of care. And um, you know, an enhanced, enhanced real-time video communication that connects the entire ecosystem. So how do we bring in touch all of those different points across the continuum of care, including doctors, nurses, patients, of course, administrators for everyday utilization, even insurance companies, and all the peripheral vendors that work across the healthcare system. Um, we also look at the Zoom platform as a, a key component for population wellness. Um, and we can ensure remote and rural communities get equal access um, regardless of where you're at. Um, our unified communication platform is playing an absolutely critical role during the pandemic, um, as we've, we've spoken about, um, especially by use of direct-to-consumer telemedicine, but a variety of other applications. Um, and it's gonna continue to play a major role as providers embrace both the hybrid model for working together, as well as a hybrid model of care that emphasizes patients' treatments where and where they are. So we expect even, um, you know, even after the pandemic, uh, you know, we're gonna, uh, as providers are used to telemedicine, patients are used to telemedicine, um, it's gonna become a new normal as far as how we can provide care and healthcare professionals can, can be anywhere um, and provide care to their patients. So um, as healthcare providers look to deploy um, and expand their telehealth networking capabilities, Zoom for Healthcare, we're well positioned to meet their needs and ensure them that you remain compliant. And that's what we're here to talk about today is um, with the relevant um, regulations. So let's talk a little bit about Zoom communication healthcare platform and sort of the multi-purpose use of the platform across the healthcare enterprise, which a lot of organizations are taking advantage of. Um, the platform, the, the Zoom healthcare platform offering, it can be deployed in a range, uh, you know, sort of a range of ways to meet the diverse needs of healthcare customers from just everyday healthcare administration for collaboration, as you can see, um, medical education that would be educating doctors to maintain their, um, their, their, their medical knowledge, internal trainings, um, wellness and prevention to educate patients. Um, the number of telemedicine applications that could be what we call direct to consumer where you're in any location on your phone speaking to a clinician or it can be diagnostic telemedicine where you plug medical devices uh, into the computer and you can look in an ear and otoscope, um, listen to heart and lung sounds, run a stethoscope through the Zoom platform and these type of things. So. Um, it's all about based on the application need, being able to provide that, but also just patient-centered care offerings because we're seeing a shift away from just providing direct care of doctor seeing patients, but the entire care team being involved. So during the pandemic alone, our solutions have helped to provide education, preventive care for high-risk populations, improve care and capabilities in rural areas and sort of bridge that geographic gap. Um, and we can also do that with limited uh, broadband connectivity and provide behavioral mental health services, I think, which has been a real challenge um, all along. It's always a challenge in, in access issues, but I think during COVID, of course, we've all seen, um, you know, it's become a bigger issue given the circumstances and we can do that with one-on-one -on -one or group settings. And then of course, um, and allow patients to join from their homes. Uh, 
just immediate coordination and, uh, and as well as real-time assessment of disaster preparedness and response is also very important by using um, video technology in the Zoom platform. And I think what's also big is reduce travel and provide cost-effective continuing education and training for healthcare professionals. Um, you know, how do we do less with more? Um, there's a male distribution of healthcare professionals in larger centers of excellence in larger cities. And um, there's also that geographic gap. So, um, you know, it's, it's more efficient to move information than it is people. And, you know, that's the whole premise of, uh, of um, why video has been so success successful. And of course, during the actual pandemic. So let's just talk a little bit about Zoom's partners in healthcare. Um, you know, um, Zoom for Healthcare helps clinicians and other healthcare providers provide the highest quality care um, across the organization. And that previous slide is important is the multi-purpose use. So you can have one platform and you can use it for a variety of applications to meet your needs. This is just a snapshot of some of the leading organizations that we um, partner with, many of whom have testimonials and case studies. Um, I'd advise you to go on our website where you can learn more about their experiences and more about the platform and best, best practices and actually um, um, some case studies. Um, so, and, and, and just like you, these organizations and many others around the world, they choose Zoom for many reasons. But of course, one of those is um, HIPAA compliance and um, I'm looking at security and privacy. So first of all, uh, as I said, we have a international, um, um, internationally, we have a lot of different folks watching this. So let's just talk about uh, what HIPAA is if you're not familiar with it and why is it important. Um, HIPAA is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, which was developed in 1996. And it's a, it's a United States federal law that lays out privacy and security standards that protect the confidentiality of protected health information, all right, um, which we call PHI. Uh, they're national standards to protect sensitive patient health information from being disclosed without the patient's consent or knowledge, okay? And so how does Zoom meet that HIPAA compliance? Um, Zoom, of course, uh, went through a uh, um, um, high-level reviews, and our HIPAA attestation was performed by an independent third-party auditor that reviewed the affirmed um, that Zoom implements the controls needed to secure protected health information according to the requirements of the, the HIPAA security rule of breach, breach notifications um, and the privacy rule. Um, Zoom is responsible for the administrative, technical, and physical safeguards that prevent against any authorized access um, um, uh, for protected health information in the Zoom environment. So in the course of providing services to healthcare customers, the Zoom platform and Zoom phone enables HIPAA compliance to covered entities, okay? So uh, covered entities is you as the healthcare organization and Zoom is the actual business associate. In provision and operating the Zoom HIPAA services, Zoom complies with the provisions of the HIPAA security rule but it required an applicable um, um, as a business associate. So let's take another step and dig a little deeper. Um, what is a business, what is a BAA, a business associate agreement? So another term you're gonna hear in connection with Zoom for healthcare is the business associate agreement. And it, this is actually a legal contract that describes how business associates, which is the actual organization that Zoom is managing their patient health information or subcontractor business associates, which is, what, which is what Zoom is for the healthcare customer, how we adhere to HIPAA, along with the responsibilities and risks they take um, in providing um, services to its healthcare customers. So um, a BAA does need to be in place for the covered entity or business associates that wish to place protected health information or PHI in Zoom's platform. Um, I think one of the, the good things though is that no manual configuration needs to occur to enable feature enhancements. Zoom's HIPAA offering, uh, it allows its healthcare customers to leverage the Zoom platform while staying maintaining privacy, security, and compliance. Um, just one last thing that I'm, I'm, I'm really I'm proud to announce is you know, Zoom, we, we know it's important to be able to reach across the continuum of care, regardless if you're listening and you're in a small practice as a single provider, maybe a federally qualified health center or a rural health clinic, um, all of the different things. Um, but we recognize that you need the same access to the tools that large centers of excellence do. So uh, what Zoom has done is we've actually are expanding access to the Zoom healthcare. And um, for those of you that are familiar with us, we've actually removed the $200 minimum that was previously required to obtain a business associate agreement. Um, and we have an automated process now. If you go to um, Zoom Healthcare, you can get one through nine license where you can automatically, through an automated process, get a, um, get a BAA. Um, we've also enhanced our features um, with the, the, uh, the, the platform for our healthcare customers to leverage more Zoom platform features. So you get Zoom phone, you can use our cloud, um, which is our, our cloud voice over IP phone solution. 
um, the ability to access cloud recordings and administrator the dashboards and reports and in meeting persistence chat. Um, so basically the entire platform is covered under the business associate agreement. And um, with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Hillary. Thank you. Excellent, thanks Ron. We're now gonna open up the webinar for Q and A. So let's jump to the questions. Um, the first question is for you, Velchami. Which stage of the SDLC do you think is the most important? I think it is the design stage. I think I briefly mentioned it in my session as well. I think if you don't uh, address the design stage, then you're always chasing problems. I think you need to make sure that design is good and all the remaining stages are basically uh, checks and balances. Great. Right, and here's another question, um, potentially for you, Brendan. My company needs to discuss sensitive, confidential content in our Zoom meetings. Does Zoom have any protections that prevent people from recording and linking the content? Uh, that's a great question, and uh, we actually have a number of features uh, on that front. Um, so we have our visual watermark, for example, that when turned on, will put uh, identifying information on the screen if someone were to capture an image of uh, the meeting. But then we also have our audio watermarking feature that if someone uh, were to record that session, uh, we have the ability to help identify who did that recording. So between the audio watermark and the uh, visual watermark, uh, you have a way to track uh, if someone were to record that in an unauthorized manner. Yeah, and also Hillary, I'd like to add on to what uh, Brandon said. Also, my favorite feature also is for the very sensitive meetings, in addition to protecting those uh, meeting content, but also you can enable the meeting registration feature, right? Meaning every participant, you can get a unique New link, right? That is a pretty cool feature as well for some very sensitive meetings. By the way, it's also you can enable E2E as well. You know, Max also here. So, yeah. That's great. And Ron, a question for you. Does the Zoom healthcare team have any predictions for telemedicine and how has the COVID pandemic impacted that? Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. So I think, um, you know, just some of the data when you look pre, um, when you look pre COVID for those uh, we know this from self-insured employers and through um, insurance companies. For those that actually had access to be able to um, see their clinician or their doctor uh, over a, a their own device, um, the user rate was less than three percent. Um, you know, out of necessity, of course, during COVID, um, you know, some of those numbers, outpatient visits were up to seventy to ninety percent. So now that physicians and patients, as I said earlier, are familiar with it, if you look at some of the data out there. Um, you know, a lot of organizations and, and just some anecdotal data and some of the some of the studies, you know, they predict that, you know, 15 to 30 percent of actual outpatients visits um, would be done virtually. So it's definitely had an impact in the way that care delivery is going to be provided. Super. And we have a question from Nancy. She would like to know, how can I quickly get rid of meeting disruptors? Happy to jump in on, on that one. Uh, so the, the best tool that we have available uh, is the security shield, which will be on that bottom toolbar, which you have the ability to immediately remove folks from the meeting, as well as uh, file reports, or uh, in a meeting, if you'd uh, like the ability to pause it for a moment while responding to that, all that's available off of that security shield icon. And also we published several blogs last year. Right? Maybe you can go to our blog website, a lot of uh, features and that you can enable, right? You know, lock the meeting, the password, the waiting room and the meeting registration. A lot of features can really help you to make sure those disruptors, they, they cannot enter your meeting. Yeah. Great. And what is engineering's biggest security accomplishment since the Zoom boom? Uh, I'll take that. So I think there are a lot of accomplishments. One is uh, uh, basically we talked about uh, uh, like E2E and then uh, one is uh, Brendan just talked about the, the whole security shield. So there is a, we, we have made security so easy to use for an end user and that's something uh, we took a lot of effort on. And then uh, I briefly talked about the whole SDLC process. So we're looking at what is uh, on the front end for you, what is useful for you and then on the back end as well, like what uh, we are doing to make sure that the product and services uh, completely secure. I, I would look at those three as some of the major areas of accomplishments. Eric, you want to add anything? Yes, yeah, so you are so right. I think the Max and the team you know, did a great job, right? To enable 
E2E, you know, E2E feature, right? It's very important. In addition to those three things, I also want to see one thing behind the scene, you may not see that is, uh, you know, you know, we shared our, you know, source code with quite a few third party, you know, vendors to double check, triple check, you know, the, the security, privacy from a source code level, right? That's also something that's very important and critical to our the, the code, you know, security and also make sure there's you no know, any potential, you know, privacy and security issues as well. Again, you know, a lot of efforts behind the scene to really help us. Yeah. And Eric, people are wondering, does Zoom sell user data? <laughs> no, absolutely not. So we're not an advertisement company. So we do have a free users, but they also have us, you know, paid subscribers, you know, mainly focus on the enterprise business customers prior to the pandemic crisis. You know, we, we never ever wanted to, to go into the advertise, advertisement business. So no, we never, yeah. Great. And here's an interesting question about people going back to the offices after COVID. So uh, you spoke about supporting a safe return to office buildings. How are you thinking about security and privacy with things like virtual secretaries or the people counter tool? Randy, you want to take that? Definitely. So, I mean, when we look at any of our features, we're always looking at, uh, you know, how to do it in a safe and secure manner. And we're excited about some of those features, um, such as uh, the, uh, virtual uh, secretary when you walk into the building um, and are able to be meet it, uh, greeted by a Zoom room. We actually have a wonderful blog post uh, on this topic and a lot of the items that we are doing on that front. Great. Anyone else want to add anything or I'll go to the next question. Yeah, also just to quickly, so as we are re-entering the office, you know, we do work together with our customers and our partners and uh, listen to their feedback and uh, so try to add those features quickly because again, it's something new, right? How to support the, the hybrid working place, right? Is something very new and any feedback, you know, from our customers and partners, we are very, you know, very calm. And then we can quickly innovate, add those features based on feedback to our product. And Ron, we have another healthcare question for you. Where do you see Zoom having the most impact in all segments of healthcare? No, uh, that's a that's a great question. Um, I, I think, you know, when you look at healthcare globally, you know, we're moving away from just what we would call sick care, right? When you're basically sick, you see the provider, and you know, that's still going to be a very important component, of course, of healthcare. And, and Zoom plays a key part of that, and it will continue to play a key part in that. But it's also about how do we reach across what we call the, the continuum of care. When you're in healthcare, you think of the continuum of care from the home to, to the entry point, which is the physician office, to maybe a smaller hospital. Then if they can't manage it there, they go to the, the larger. Um, Zoom does a great job of being able to reach outside. Um, we're a great enterprise solution, and um, we're being used by you know, some of the biggest um, healthcare systems um, um, around as far as the enterprise solution. But we also are very good about reaching outside of the walls of the enterprise. So we're going to be used as we shift the model from just doctors being the one who sees the patient, the care team will, and to do that, you have to be able to reach across the continuum of care. So the patient's home, um, to skilled nursing facilities, to primary care, and having all of those increased touch points is what's gonna give us sort of what we call population-based health. And um, we see Zoom as a key point and um, well-equipped to be able to provide that in the future as we see that shift in the incentives um, away from just doctors seeing patients to population-based health. Super interesting. And Max, we have an encryption question for you. How does the new end-to-end -end encryption affect the speed of the Zoom meeting from device to device, if any? That's a great question. We, uh, we've really observed no changes of speed and performance in terms of encryption. Um, you know, all Zoom, end -end, all Zoom meetings are encrypted, whether using enhanced encryption or um, or end to end encryption, and and so um, if anything, that would be the expensive part, and that really isn't very expensive at all, um, as we can tell, because we use Zoom and it performs very well every day. Um, for end to end, there is a little, there is an additional step of a key exchange when the meeting starts or when participants enter and leave the meeting, um, and that's when you would see it, if anything. But according to our measurements, you can't even tell the difference. And so, you know, it, it might be a little bit of a uh, of a historical artifact for people to think that encryption is slow, but with modern processors and modern encryption, it's actually extremely fast and uh, we don't expect anyone to notice it. Cool. 
And Sue wrote in, a, Sue wrote in with a question, is there a way to limit geographical areas a user can connect a meeting from? Happy to jump in on this one. And yes, we do have the ability uh, in your meeting settings to actually say what, uh, uh, which countries that people can join your meeting from. And you can either do uh, an allow list to say people can only join from this part of the world or explicitly say, I do not want individuals to be able to join from certain parts of the world so that you have flexibility depending on uh, the security posture you want for your meeting or session. Great. And I like this question. I'm a security engineer. What values or qualities are you looking for in future employees? Do you have any tips on for applying? Uh, I, I can take that because I, I do spend a fair amount of time interviewing people and we, we welcome your application. So, so please, there are definitely openings on our job, uh, on our job portal. So, so check those out. Um, you know, for security engineering, uh, we, we really like to see that, that people have, have a good basic understanding of the, the, the cryptographic primitives that you would use when building a secure application. Um, we want them to think about, um, you know, other ways for you to detect or potentially avoid security problems in writing everyday code that isn't related to security. And, and sometimes that's when things happen that, that sometimes you know, non-security related code can have a security bug in it. So you don't only focus on security code when you're, when you're um, trying to make a secure application. And we often like to know, you know what's your understanding of how security is changing. I mean, every week we see different news reports and, and different types of attacks that, that are um, available. And, and uh, you know, we have to be aware of those to know, you know, are we doing the right things to protect against them? So these are the types of things we care about. Um, and obviously just a passion for this technology is really important too, because um, you know, we feel really strongly that by incorporating this technology in Zoom, we're really um, providing an, a, a very valuable service to, to our users. And um, you know, we'd like for people to feel good and as passionate as we do about providing that. Any other feedback from Volchami or Eric or Brendan? Now we can just go to the next question. Um, yeah, I think uh, Max covered it uh, pretty well. Uh, but we are also looking for uh, regular engineers with uh, a lot of security background as well. So we just want to make sure that uh, pretty much all our engineers are either trained or we have uh, engineers that actually have the product knowledge, but also a good solid uh, security foundation. That's a great point, Valchami. I forgot to mention that. That my team, we're, do, we're always doing interviews and sometimes just for to expand our own team, but often to help other teams. And just to make sure that the candidates who you know who are coming into Zoom have a good understanding of security um, matters that uh, that might not be obvious in terms of the job description. Great. Thanks. And is Zoom doing a CISO council this year? Maybe Max or Brendan, you could answer that. Definitely. So we have had the CISO Council and that, that CISO Council is continuing and we've been very appreciative of the feedback that we have received uh, from that council and, and look forward to the continued engagement. Great. So we do have uh, weekly meetings with the CISO Council members. So it's an ongoing uh, and I think uh, when we talked about all the security accomplishments, maybe this is something that uh, we should have mentioned as well. A lot of these, uh, we have these advisors uh, that are uh, helping us as well. Great. And someone was asking, where can I find your security white papers? I can actually answer this. Um, in January, we recently launched our trust center. And so it's a one-stop shop for all our security, privacy, trust and safety resources that includes FAQs, white papers, and we're going to keep building it out to make it as robust and helpful as possible. So definitely check out our Zoom Trust Center for information like that. And here's a question. Um, we use Zoom in our retirement community for weekly help sessions to demo program settings, et cetera. Are there any limitations on screen sharing to be aware of? Great question uh, with respect to how our screen sharing works. Uh, the, the one thing to be aware of with screen sharing in Zoom is as a security and privacy feature, uh, by default, if you are sharing your screen and a Zoom window is up, we do not share the Zoom window. So if you are doing sessions to show people how to use 
Zoom, uh, there is a setting that you would need to change to be able to show your Zoom window in a meeting. Uh, but beyond that, in terms of screen sharing, if you are sharing it on your screen, we generally allow that to be shared uh, through the Zoom session. Great. And for meeting disruptions, what about a simple emergency button to pause the meeting? So uh, that is a feature uh, that we recently released and that is available under the security shield uh, on that bottom toolbar to, to basically pause the meeting. Great. And this question, I need to host a public meeting, but I'm worried about meeting disruptions. What are your tips for preventing this? So on that one, if it is a public meeting, we highly recommend uh, using an option such as uh, our webinar product, the uh, option that we're actually using today. Whereas you can see, you have uh, a public group that's available, but there are options such as the Q&A, which we're using today for questions that come up. And you can always promote a member of the audience uh, into the panelist role so that they can be on screen. They can speak in that, but generally they would be in a view only mode. Uh, to help prevent that meeting disruption. It's that nice balance of allowing participation, but also having the fine grain controls uh, in the session. Great. And if a meeting participant chooses not to agree with the recording, what happens? So right now, if uh, someone chooses not to be recorded in a session, uh, uh, because uh, a, a meeting is a mix of audio and video, um, we offer the option for them to leave that session at the moment. Makes sense, great. And Brendan, I'll give you a break. Thanks for answering all those questions. And here's a fun question. We had several people write in about the lawyer cat filter incident. And so people would like to know, how do I use filters um, without ending up like the unfortunate uh, lawyer cat? <laughs> I think Eric is the expert on that. No, I'm not an expert. First of all, I know for sure I'm not a cat. So, <laughs> and so, and I'm live here. So anyway, so we do have a blog, right? So feel free, right? So go to uh, look at a blog, how to enable those filter features, how to disable, how to use a virtual camera, and a lot of flexibility, right? For sure you can, you know, uh, disable those features, yeah. Great. We also had a fun question, Eric, that I'd like to ask. Why did you name the company Zoom? Uh, first of all, as I'm pretty sure this uh, as no relationship is uh, privacy and security. Okay, <laughs> so, That's true. okay we'll and, save that uh, for a different one. Again, the name not for me, actually, for okay. one of our advisors. So, and it's pretty catchy, you know. So that's uh, we like like that name. So, yeah. great. And LJ wrote in with a question: Will we ever be able to use different passwords for different meetings? I don't like that when I set a specific password for a meeting. It then makes that the it then makes that the password for all meetings. So I'm happy to jump in on that one. So right now with the product, um, if you set a password for your uh, personal meeting ID, your PMI, uh, that password will apply to all meetings where you use your PMI. However, when you schedule a meeting, you can uh, choose to not use your PMI which will actually create a new random meeting number. And along with that, you can define distinct uh, settings specific for that meeting. And that can be a distinct uh, password, but that can also be other settings, whether that's uh, enabling waiting room, uh, changing uh, the registration settings, or all a number of the other features that we've mentioned. So highly recommend when scheduling, you know, taking a look at that option, of maybe not using your PMI if you want to have unique settings for that uh, particular meeting. Yeah, also just quickly, normally I use the PMI for my internal meetings and always use uh, one time meeting ID for my external meetings because my team is always know my you know, PMI, so. Yeah. And here's a question. I use the paid Zoom platform. I see patients on Zoom. Is it secure enough for me to see them and maintain full security and confidentiality? 
Yeah, this is Ron. I can take that one. Yes, as long as you're the as long as you're the one who actually has let's associated with the business associate agreement. As long as you're the one who actually has the healthcare account, any of those that you connect to will have the same security and privacy um, that you do. So the answer is yes. Wonderful. And a question from Cindy, is Zoom going to be able to offer RTMPS data transfer? So uh, in, in terms of that, uh, uh, this is a protocol that is used for streaming um, to uh, third-party services. And yes, Zoom does have the ability to support RTMP as well as RTMPS. Uh, we have native integrations with a number of platforms, as well as the ability to set a custom uh, streaming URL so that you can stream to any platform that supports RTMP or RTMPS. Great. Um... It looks like we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, let's see. How do, this is a question from Kim. How do we get people to join from abroad? <laughs> I, I'm happy to jump in on this one. Uh, so part of the power of uh, the Zoom platform is our global network. Uh, and so with a uh, join link, folks can join from anywhere in the world uh, to the Zoom platform using, you know, whatever device that is available to them, be that uh, computer, mobile, uh, room systems. Uh, we also have a, a global network of uh, telephone numbers. Our, our focus is to be able to connect people worldwide. So we offer a range of opportunities uh, and pathways to do that. Super. And we have a question um, asking to share the video that Eric mentioned for teachers using Zoom securely for Safer Internet Day. Hopefully they can, uh, the Zoom team can drop that in the chat. You can also find it on the Zoom YouTube. Um, and for the final question, uh, it's a simple one. Can you tell us more about on Zoom? So Chami, do you want to take that? Uh, yeah, sure. I think, you know, one of the things that uh, we started, uh, like Zoom has been like an enterprise service pre-COVID and through COVID, uh, we've seen multitude of use cases. I think uh, Zoom is being used for like yoga classes, Zoom has been used for like training classes. There is a lot of these other use cases, which uh, basically have grown through this period. I think what we are trying to do with the on Zoom is uh, like enable uh, those type of use cases, uh, what is needed for them to be successful. So if you're a yoga instructor, and I mean, you want to do this on Zoom, uh, like how can Zoom help us, et cetera. So that is the fundamental of like what we are trying to do there. Uh, it's more like a, uh, like a marketplace for you. If you have skills, like how do you actually uh, either show your skills? It could be for free or it could be for paid, et cetera. And uh, we are seeing how Zoom can actually build all the foundations. And then uh, Eric, you want to add? Oh, no, that's great. I think just that, you know, you know, some of you, if you never experienced, uh, you know, the on Zoom, you know, platform, just to go to on Zoom and uh, to try to join some yoga class or maybe a cooking class. I, I did join once. It's pretty enjoy like that. Yeah. And one of the things we have also learned through this is there are some businesses that uh, we got direct feedback. Some of the businesses, they thought they're going to be completely shut down uh, with COVID. Now they realize They've expanded the marketplace beyond their local geography. Now they have like an international audience and, uh, the, and they don't even plan to come back to the local office going forward. So th those are some of the uh, opportunities that we see for our on Zoom customers. And you should definitely go uh, try out some of the classes and maybe become a host and do some of your sessions as well. Wonderful. Well, we're almost at time. Um, thank you for everyone for joining us today. Um, Eric Valchami, any parting words before we go? Yeah, I would like to say for all the participants, you know, for, for today's uh, webinar, I truly appreciate it for all greater support and trust. You know, welcome uh, your feedback. We will do all we can to keep it delivering happiness to you, to focus on our privacy and security. And uh, see you next month. Thank you so much for your time today. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.